It is my pleasure to introduce to you the next speakers. They are joining us online and they are Jojo Meta, the executive director of Stop Ecocide International. She is on a mission to support the establishment of ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court. She will be joined by Lammert van Raan. He is a member of parliament for the Party for the Animals in the Netherlands. And last year he submitted a proposal in the Dutch House of Representatives to criminalize ecocide. Together they will host a masterclass on ecocide and food. Welcome Jojo and Lammert. I hope they're with us. They are. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm very happy that you're here and I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we, we're probably going to start with um, a kind of background um, presentation from me and then Lammert will be following with more about the political implications, the situation in the Netherlands and so on. So with, with your permission, um, I, I'd like to give you all um, some background information and a, a little sense of where, of what's important about this move to criminalize ecocide and where it is now um, and the potential that, that it brings, um, particularly in the context of today. So ecocide is generally understood as severe harm to nature. So meaning to destroy the environment. In, in terms of the root of the word, it comes from Greek and Latin, so the Greek oikos meaning home and the Latin cadere to kill, so to kill one's home. And eco of course has come to mean relating to the environment, in other words to our planetary home. And this global view of home is relatively recent. We've only been able to view and photograph of course the earth from space since just over 50 years ago. And from that moment our planetary perspective changed. Suddenly, home had a whole new meaning. So nowhere, at least as far as our technology has been able to discern, is there any evidence of any planet like Earth, anywhere else that can sustain life as we know it. And for the last nearly 12,000 years of relative climate stability, that is exactly what our planetary home has done, sustain life as we know it, facilitating the spread and the technical, technological advance of human civilization. So while this has, of course, benefited many in terms of material comfort, life expectancy, societal support structures and so forth, this advance has increasingly taken place within a framework of thought, a particular framework that perceives nature as something other, as a resource to be exploited or even as a foe to be conquered. And indeed, the Oxford English Dictionary actually defines nature as opposed to humans. And with this perspective, ever since the Industrial Revolution, we have been, um, perhaps at first unwittingly, but now recklessly and even knowingly, we've been disrupting the biological, the chemical, the atmospheric systems on whose stable interaction we intimately and deeply depend. And greenhouse gas emissions are just one part of this story. Bit by bit, with every felled forest, every polluted river system, every species extinction, oil spill, toxic waste leak, nuclear or mining disaster, we are committing ecocide. Relentlessly and with startling speed, we are killing our home. And along the way, we're exacerbating social injustice, racial inequality and resource conflicts. And because our legal system doesn't treat environmental destruction with the seriousness that, you know, we're now beginning to realize that, that it warrants, we are doing this currently with impunity. Now, interestingly, the first use of the word ecocide dates from around the same time as our first perceptions of the entire planet as our home. Uh, it was coined by a biologist, um, I, I'll come back to the slide in a little bit if you don't mind. Um, it was coined by a biologist, Arthur Galston, who helped develop the defoliant Agent Orange and then was deeply shocked by its use to such devastating effect in the Vietnam War. And on the public international stage, 
the word ecocide was first used by Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme at the UN Environment Conference, the first environment conference in Stockholm in 1972. And he pointed out that the air and the oceans and that the future of our environment are a common phenomenon. They're not something we can address individually or even as individual nations. The future of the environment is a common future that affects us all. And in particular, he stated that destruction brought about by large scale use of bulldozers and pesticides. And it's interesting in the context of today, today's event that he picks out those particular examples. Anyway, he says that this is an outrage sometimes described as ecocide, which requires urgent international attention. And 50 years later, almost 50 years later, the world is at last beginning to pay attention to this concept of ecocide. It's been discussed in the background of political and legal circles, but the re-emergence of this word into public discourse is largely credit to uh, one UK lawyer, Polly Higgins, who was a very dear friend of mine and is no longer with us, and with whom I launched the Stop Ecocide International campaign back in 2017. And this campaign focuses um, in particular on progressing the establishment of ecocide as an international crime. We believe it should sit alongside genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity as an atrocity level crime. Now, some query whether it should be compared with genocide, and our response is that while it is certainly not the same crime, it is of a deadly serious nature and it belongs in this international category. Um, the global threat posed by the destruction of nature in the planet-wide crisis that we're now facing it is not just to a people, to a whole people or to part of a people as with genocide, but to many millions of species, including birds, insects, animals, but of course also including us. As grassroots movements, such as Fridays for Future, the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion and others, have been pointing out, especially in the last two years, that we are facing an existential threat to life as we know it. And in this context, and indeed helped by those mobilizations and the window of conversation that those mobilizations have opened in the global media, our campaign has been rapidly gaining momentum. Indeed, we've just passed a key milestone. Last month, an expert panel of top international criminal and environmental lawyers convened by our foundation, the Stop Ecocide Foundation, proposed a legal definition of the term suitable for adoption into the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, as a fifth crime alongside genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression, which was added more recently, giving us, of course, the hopeful signal that amending this document is possible. While there have been working definitions of ecocide before, this particular drafting project was uh, arose in direct response to political demand. So both to the explicit call of the climate vulnerable island nations, Vanuatu and the Maldives, who at the end of 2019 uh, directly called at the International Criminal Court for serious consideration of adding ecocide, and whose countries of course are directly impacted by rising sea levels and heavy tropical storms. They're on the sharp end of the effects of climate change right now. But it also responded to an immediate request from Swedish parliamentarians who approached us last summer and said, well, this is, you know, this is clearly your area of expertise. Would you be able to convene or commission a clear definition that states could actually consider and, and propose potentially at the ICC? So now if we could show that first slide, you'll be able to see the incredibly concise core definition of ecocide, which the panel distilled. And what they emerged with as a core definition is just one paragraph long. Ecocide is unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. And you'll notice it doesn't describe what acts those might be. And that's very important because as we've realized over the last 
decades. We can't predict what awful ecocidal practices might be dreamed up between one year and the next. But what we can do is potentially circumscribe what level of harm any act is allowed to create. And that has been the folk that, that that is ultimately the focus of this very simple definition. But don't be fooled in the sense that this definition is very is strongly based on previous legal precedent and every word and phrase and conjunction in that sentence has been very carefully considered. And we can potentially come back a bit later to more detail um, on the definition of those terms that are within that paragraph. But for now, um, you can close the slides again for now. Thank you. Um, the warmth of response to this legal definition has been remarkable. And literally within a week of launching, there were articles in over 100 global publications uh, from the Financial Times to Der Spiegel and from Bloomberg to Le Monde. Um, I've, ju I've just done an interview for a large Dutch newspaper as well, NRC. And it, it has also prompted political action. So just as a couple of examples, in, in Bangladesh, the Environment, Forest and Climate Change Committee has recommended that ecocide be codified. Um, diplomats in the Caribbean have been recommending that, you know, that, whole, that the whole Caribbean community pay attention to this definition. And encouragingly, even in the UK, my home country, um, there has now been an amendment added to the government's Environment Bill, which includes the newly released definition in full. So all of these diplomats and politicians are now joining a conversation which actually already includes EU states such as France and Belgium and, of course, via the amazing campaigning work of Lamert, the Netherlands too, um, and also, also already has the support of public figures as influential and diverse as Pope Francis, Greta Thunberg and even Paul McCartney. Now, since the International Criminal Court's mandate is the prosecution of individuals, the addition of ecocide to the list of crimes which, which are considered, and, and, and this is how the ICC describes them, the, most serious, the crimes of most serious concern to the international community as a whole, this would make key corporate and political actors personally liable to criminal prosecution in any member state which ratifies the crime should their decisions threaten severe and either widespread or long-term environmental damage. It thus creates a, an enforceable deterrent to help prevent finance from flowing at all to projects that could destroy ecosystems. Because nothing concentrates the mind like having one's personal freedom on the line. Very different to being able to hide behind the corporate veil and simply dole out fines and adjust your budget to do so. However, more than that and beyond that, ecocide law may prove to be not just a stick, but also a carrot in that well-known metaphor. So setting a criminal parameter will not only steer activity away from hazards, so acting, if you like, as a kind of health and safety law for the planet, um, but it is also likely to stimulate innovation and development. So in a healthy direction, in a wide range of economic sectors. And many of the solutions, as we know, many of the solutions we need to transition to sustainability are already available. Renewable energy, circular economy, and particularly relevant to this audience, regenerative agriculture. But these methods and practices are not being supported or developed at scale while the finance continues to flow towards the same old destructive practices, leaving those who want to do the right thing at a distinct disadvantage. So criminalizing ecosystem destruction could help to um, encourage all of those who are moving in the right direction and to encourage political policy and subsidies to flow in a better direction as well. It could also act as a foundational support, it could shore up, it could strengthen the whole edifice of environmental law globally. It's a relatively new body of law um, and is still not taken as seriously as m more longer established and more anthropocentric forms of law that defend people or property. 
And so having a law at the top level that puts environmental destruction on a par with destruction of people, it will support all of those working to improve regulation and to improve best practice from frontline activists to academics, scientists, NGOs and policymakers. And there is, of course, a huge potential relevance here to the production of food as agribusiness accounts for a significant percentage of climate, exacerbate, climate change exacerbating emissions, but also potential ecocides of a very direct kind. Perhaps the first to spring to mind might be Amazon deforestation, 70% of which is felled to make way for cattle production, including the soil used to feed the livestock. However, one might also think of certain industrial approaches to fishing, for example, such as bottom trawling, which can devastate the seabed and ruin entire marine ecosystems indiscriminately. And while it would no doubt be naive to believe that establishing this crime would be a silver bullet for all of our environmental woes, uh, or even prevent all ecocides, I mean, you know, murder has been a crime as long as we can remember, but it doesn't stop people being killed. However, it does change norms. It changes what's acceptable. And it is also difficult to see how current practices will really change without a hard stop intervention of this kind. So a food and farming report from the UN five years ago now, uh, in 2016, clearly stated that if we are to feed the world and, you know, a growing population, this is, is not impossible, but with our current approach will not work. And that local farming methods adapted to local landscapes are actually the logical route to take. But in practice, we haven't seen adequate policy or investment to follow that direction. And with a sort of safety rail like ecocide law, this could finally be set in motion. But I think perhaps, and I'll finish with this for now, I think perhaps the most powerful effect of defining and criminalizing ecocide as an international crime, might be that of beginning to shift our cultural and moral assumptions. So our understanding of our place in and, and our responsibility towards the natural world is in grave need of a reality check. <laughs> and I'm sure that this audience will be um, a very understanding of that need and that, um, that hopeful possibility that this, this law and that other other aspects um, will, you know, could, could bring in, into, into play in this regard. I find it an interesting irony that indigenous leaders and faith leaders like the Pope, uh, spiritual leaders in a way, are the ones who are calling out um, our current system as not relating to reality, because in reality, we're deeply embedded in the natural world and we deeply depend on it. So calling out and condemning ecocide for what it is could be exactly what we need if we're going to begin to transform our relationship with the earth from one of harm to one of harmony. And that, in turn, may be the, it, that could, it could be that that's the very best way to ensure that our children and our children's children will still be able to call this beautiful planet home. Thank you. Um, Polly uh, springs to mind, and Jojo, I think uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm pent up here in a in a hotel room, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm assuming we're now uh, live. Uh, and thank you, thank you for these uh, incredible uh, words. Um, and indeed, your definition that you proposed. Um, oh. I, I understand I'm now live. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Jojo. And let me reiterate what an incredible uh, pleasure and honor it is to present this uh, this uh, workshop, this masterclass uh, together with you. And um, yeah, you spoke on this uh, new new definition on, uh, on, on ecocide law, the 200 words that uh, could be incredibly important to change uh, to change history. So uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for uh, listening to me. I'll spend some uh, 10 minutes uh, talking on how we in the Netherlands uh, put forward an uh, initiative uh, proposal. Uh, could I have the first slide? Actually, could I have the second slide? Uh, there we are. So this is the situation we're currently facing. 
a, a branch uh, on which we're sitting and you see a white, you actually you now see probably two white males. One, is, one of them is me and the other one is the guy sawing off the branch on which he's sitting. Next slide, please. Uh, and that indicates uh, the situation we're in. And in fact, in fact, we were uh, both, uh, I think, uh, struck by this uh, um, proverb, or just saying by en uh, Enzo Adams, famous photographer, and that in fact, uh, we as a movement, and this is not only our uh, political uh, movement, but also the Stop Ecocide movement, that we have in certain, to fight our own government to save the environment. And this is something that sticks in my mind. And next slide, please. So um, as Jojo already mentioned, uh, we are standing on the shoulder, a particular big shoulder, large shoulders of one particular woman, uh, Polly Higgins, you see in the middle. And uh, we had the, both had the honor to work with her as had these two other women. It's, by the way, it's the second from the left, who is uh, Polly. And here is a, um, a slide from an initiative proposal I wrote for a city council, a member of a political party, Jonas van Lammeren in Amsterdam in 2015, it was produced in 2016, um, to start awareness. And the reason I am so much touched by the um, concept of, uh, of, of ecocide law, is that it embodies, uh, it gives us a weapon, in fact, and a stick and a carrot, as uh, Giorgio said, to, to have a counter balance against uh, international forces, uh, globalized forces like uh, money or investments, who have no really countervailing power. And indeed, the very act, the very uh, legal framework of ecocide makes it possible to have a, a very powerful counter frame. Next slide, please. So, and the reason I was, uh, very stimulated, we were very stimulated to write this initiative paper in the Netherlands was when I had a debate with the Minister of uh, Foreign Aid and Foreign Affairs, who is a very sophisticated uh, woman and a very experienced diplomat she was before she became a, a minister. And in this debate on foreign trade, uh, we posed, I posed a question on what, what her thoughts were on ecocide. And to our stupefaction, um, she said, oh, well, ecocide, mind you, and it's 2020, 2020. Ecocide, what is this? I'm, I'm not really sure what it is. And uh, so that gave the, uh, the, the, the immediately the reason uh, for, for writing it and make this initiative paper on which I tell a bit more in a few seconds. But first of all, we're gonna do a little experiment to see if we can have a poll, the first question on the poll. And um, so I'm going to ask the um, technicians who is currently working the poll to pose the first question and to make this, uh, this happen. And I'll shut up for a minute. Okay, so can I get a clue when the poll is finished? I think it seems to stabilize. And from where I'm standing, the third option, which is to be honest, too small for me to read, uh, my mistake, uh, is deforestation. Exactly. Okay. So perhaps uh, it is clear that all uh, all mentioned are uh, a part of ecocide, and um, deforestation, as also Jojo said, is also very much related to the topic we are discussing uh, right now, which is of course the agricultural uh, issues. Can we have the next slide? So what kind of uh, sorry, the next poll. Okay. 
Yeah. Please mention them all if you can. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, close the the, the poll. Uh, the right answer uh, correctly is all of them. And that's also an aspect on why we wrote this initiative paper, um, because certainly in the in the, on, uh, amongst the politicians in the Netherlands, there isn't a broad sense that uh, ecocides can be found amongst all uh, the uh, the uh, items mentioned here, and. It shouldn't be as surprising when you delve into it, then it becomes obvious. But when you buy packets of uh, almonds or hazelnuts in the uh, in the supermarket, it's not immediately uh, uh, clear that there's a whole uh, system of uh, destruction uh, behind it. So, um, and of course, can I have the next slide? The 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 great uh, inspiration uh, comes from uh, from from Polly Higgins, uh, who said that we have to have we have to have a, a new law you have to have to envision a new law that uh, protects us from this uh, great destruction uh, which was echoed to uh, to a certain effect by a uh, greta thunberg when she said we need to change the rules and on the next slide when you click you see me and uh, uh, marianne and uh, esther posing as a uh, greta thunberg during a protest a march but Obviously, that uh, that wasn't that wasn't enough. Uh, so we there there we are uh, during a, a, a protest. Um, so we decided to write an initiative uh, paper uh, ourselves. And if I can have the next slide, please, and click uh, based on this uh, definition that uh, that uh, um, Jojo just gave, the two hundred words that could be in fact history. Next slide, please. And I think something has changed in the order of slides. Um, but, but let's stay with this one. Let's stay with this one. So in this initiative paper, we give a broad overview, broad overview on all the aspects that uh, Jojo uh, already mentioned. Uh, so we can discuss this uh, later on. Uh, but the, the main thing of an initiative paper is that we will. Uh, we have ten uh, points uh, that we want the Dutch government to decide upon, and we have grouped them in, in five subgroups. And I will I will mention briefly mention the, the five. First of all, support a call for an international uh, law of ecocide. Uh, very clearly, uh, this is this is needed. And indeed, you see here on the middle slide, you see one of the persons who is who was very much involved. In uh, drawing this uh, initiative paper, it's, he's a uh, Raki Ab, and he's a member of the Free West Papua movement, um, who is very uh, uh, vocal on um, on uh, getting the indigenous perspective uh, to towards uh, nature uh, as part as part of actually policy making. And on the left, uh, down in the left corner, you see me with. Um, Ralph, who is a minister from uh, Vanuatu, who is one of the most driven uh, countries, uh, island states in the Pacific, uh, who is also a strong member of uh, of, uh, of ecocide law, because of course uh, his his nation is one of the first nations to really suffer from the consequences of uh, of climate change uh, brought forward by uh, by ecocide. And the interesting part is, and that that's why it's great to be part of this international movement as as you all are who are watching this in this in this international movement is that uh Raki Ab in the picture and uh, Ralph know each other now because West Papua uh, is offering is planning to offer um asylum to the island states once the island states might go under and um so it's it's very important and very uh, en enlightening to see uh, those connections, those points, those dots being uh, connected uh, to each other. And when uh, Jojo mentioned famous uh, people, 
uh, to uh, to get get awareness. Also, uh, in the middle, you see me with uh, on the left hand side. You see me with the secretary of the IPCC uh, panel, uh, who's also uh, very much aware now that the uh, ecocide is an ecocide law could be very instrumental to battle uh, uh, climate change. Uh, as is, for instance, uh, and that is support call for international law, member of parliament on the right hand side down below is uh, Marie Toussaint, who is very vocal in the Euro Parliament uh, to move uh, ecocide law forward. Next slide, please. So the second one is uh, the promote the international corporate social responsibility. As we, as you know, the uh, the, the results uh, of our food system and the results of our international globalization uh, is is deforestation is 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 horrendous uh, 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 damage to our ecosystems, and so the international corporate social responsibility is now. Um, being uh, drawn up by, uh, how you say it, con confidence, and there's there's no forceful there's no forceful corporate social responsibility and uh, enforced. It's all talks and it's all uh, rather uh, freewheeling. And so the second thing we we call upon is international social responsibility. Uh, Party of the Animals in the Netherlands, as I'm sure in other countries, has a constant barrage, and you see an example here of uh, questions that we ask to our government uh, in results to, in this case, uh, the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, um, which, uh, in which the, uh, the um, uh, palm uh, uh, oil uh, production is causing havoc. Next slide. So the other one, uh, the third, uh, is uh, reinforce the rule of, uh, rule of law in countries across uh, the globe. And here you see, and I must admit, it looks a bit like I'm uh, uh, Photoshop is being used to put me in a group of indigenous people. But in fact, um, what was very striking in this meeting, this was a group of uh, uh, people from New Guinea who came to um, our parliament, Dutch parliament. And whereas some parties felt the need to express their, well, their, their uh, sorrow and their willingness to help these indigenous people, how could they, uh, how could the Dutch uh, politician help them? In fact, what was very striking is that on this visit, they came to warn us, the Western society, and they came to offer their help with uh, an, an indigenous perspective on how to um, properly live with nature. So reinforce the rule of law in countries across the globe, especially where the rule of law is not that strong. And perhaps it's now time to have the next poll that poses a question on this, uh, on this issue. So, and this, this poll is on, in how many countries do you think ecocide law already exists? And perhaps my, yep. Number five. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, the correct answer is nine. There's a nine uh, in nine countries. You see already some form of ecocide law, but in fact, currently, uh, as as our initiative paper also uh, uh, outlines, is the weaker the rule of law in a country, the more beautiful the the ecocide laws are. So especially, uh, for instance, we have a, 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 in Ukraine, and there is an ecocide law, which was put in place after a tremendous uh, damage to the environment was uh, done. And, and here you see that laws are being, being drawn up, uh, sometimes in countries that don't have a, that stronger uh, rule of law to begin with. Um, and perhaps we can have the next poll immediately as well, uh, in how many, uh, countries are there initiatives currently going on?
That is correct. <laughs> Ten in con uh, con uh, countries. There's currently an uh, initiative uh, on the way. And, um, and once again, I, I'd like to stress how important it is that you see yourselves as a, indeed a worldwide movement, not only on the current topics that the Party for the Animals, of course, is its core, but also on the, uh, on the issue of, uh, of ecocide. And these are very much uh, interlinked as, uh, as our initiative paper shows. Can I have the next slide, please? I want to speed it up a bit. So again, the, um, also we promote in this initiative, uh, assign rights to the environment. So we see that as uh, the same coin, different side of the same coin. Because on the one hand, you have to protect with, uh, with very strict laws, ecocide law. On the other hand, we feel that uh, having a right of nature themselves, it could be very, very powerful. On the left hand side, it's very obvious. You see uh, uh, a very destructive picture of, uh, of a rainforest. But on the right hand side, you might not suspect this, but here you have the view of a desert. It doesn't look like a desert, but in fact, it is a desert. It is a very um, intensely worked uh, piece of farmland, which is uh, chemically almost dead, the soil. Um, because of the use of the uh, of the pesticide, so assign rights to the environment will really be a boon to uh, to also protect not only protect it but also make it more, far more sensible that if you, uh, according to the uh, ecocide definition, um, unlawful or wanton uh, acts uh, committed to this, to to have it destroyed, you will be uh, punishable by law. Next slide, please. And last one. Uh, last of the five, and again, there's 10 in total, but we have grouped them in a, a subgroup of five, conduct a follow-up investigation into ecocide because uh, so many things are not yet uncovered or clear and there needs to be far more uh, publicity, there needs to be far more uh, awareness. Also, for instance, that the discussion on the uh, ecocide law is not a, I would say, it's not a, it's not a cozy talks amongst lawyers, uh, that decide, well, let's put, let's make it the fifth crime in the uh, Statute of Rome. In fact, it's, it's a battle behind the scenes. It's a war with words. And in fact, it became clear when we in the Netherlands made this uh, initiative uh, paper um, that in the middle of the 90s, ecocide law was to be included in the Statute of Rome. But four countries uh, in which the Dutch played a very, uh, I would say, a very uh, doubtful role. Uh, on the last minute, the definition was uh, was dropped. So um, that's another thing we need to look at our past, the role we played, and how we can put it into uh, into law. Um, the thing I also want to no, let's let's leave it for the discussion. Uh, the last slide, please. The last slide, please. And I think this uh, this is, is uh, everything, pointing fingers at the nature, and uh, in the meantime we're uh, destroying everything. So ecocide law, a uh, very important instrument to uh, to put in our hands. Thank you very much. Uh, let's open up for discussion. Thank you for these very interesting presentations. I really like this harm to harmony phrase that you used, Jojo. Um, we received quite a few questions via the chat, so I'm going to be posing them to you. Not all of them uh, are assigned to one of you specifically, so maybe for some of them you can decide um, if you'd like to answer uh, um, ask the other person to do so. And the first question came in via YouTube, and um, they're asking, does this law also include the care of oceans or seas against industrial fishing? Because we know that the outlook um, that our oceans will be empty by 2048, right? If no action is taken. Definitely. And um, let me first tell you what a pleasure it is to see you here, Barbara. Nice uh, to see you. But the, the definition uh, as uh, Jojo uh, just, well, actually, Jojo, you can, uh, you can answer this far <laughs> better than I do. Yeah, um, um, it's... A it apologies for starting to talk, I'm a politician. No, 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 so, uh, it's completely fine. <laughs> it's completely fine, don't worry. Um, 
yes, there's certainly the potential for this law to address what you're asking about in terms of the marine environment. Um, I don't know if it's possible to put my second slide onto the screen. Um, if, if it is, then great. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly refer to the definitions that elaborate that first paragraph around um, you know, what the unlawful and wanton acts. Um, for example, the, the term widespread means damage extending beyond a limited geographic area, uh, crossing state boundaries, or suffered by an entire ecosystem or species, or a large number of human beings. So one can, one can see how a context of the marine environment could fall under that, as indeed could the definition of severe, which involves very serious adverse changes, disruption or harm to any element of the environment. And the way that the group who've defined this, this, this um, very broad uh, international group of lawyers, um, is they've, they've taken the environment to, um, they've, they've looked to earth science or earth system science for a definition of the environment. Um, so it, environment includes, means the earth, it means its biosphere, cryosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere, which is basically incredibly broad um, and, you know, would certainly include marine environments. And it's very important because um, it's very important in that context that ecocide law should be an international law because, of course, um, large, large areas of the ocean fall outside of national jurisdictions. So there needs to be an approach from the international level in order to be able to sort of reach that, that aspect of um, the environment. Yes, and, and may I add a, a, a political instrument because, and, and, and the, the importance of this uh, definition. What we did uh, and what we were doing, uh, to be honest, quite some, some time ago, is to, when we use, uh, when we debate in Parliament or when we pose questions to our ministers on uh, uh, destruction, we now can really use the wording and the phrasing uh, of the definition. So, for instance, um, the, the unlawful or wanton acts committed with the knowledge, uh, also known as a recklessness, uh, we now use the, those terms in our uh, political language. Uh, so to also familiarize um, politicians with those, with those terms and also to make people aware that uh, maybe not now, but within like five to ten years, uh, they have been warned that they were acting reckless, so they can't deny that they were being reckless. Uh, so I think the, the, the definition is really important. Uh, and also you can really, as a, uh, because there's also a mass clause on how to act politically, you can really use the wording uh, in, your, in your work um, so as to, uh, to spread it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, there was a question from Lebanon asking if they could have the script of the eco side law. Um, and also, I understood, uh, Lamart, that from the Dutch initiative, there's also uh, translations available, right? So maybe you can provide some more information on where to find this. Yes, of course, of course, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I was delighted to find the links to the uh, uh, English, Arabic and French version in, uh, in the uh, documentation of this conference. And uh, so there you, you, can, uh, you can find it. We're also working on a Spanish uh, translation. Um, so everybody can, can use it. However, be aware that we wrote this, uh, this initiative paper in uh, 2020 and we will make sure we'll do an update on the uh, on the on the definition because as Jojo said that that definition became available only last you know two weeks ago in this breakthrough announcement in which um, very impressive uh, lawyers worked on this definition. Yeah, I would I would just add to that that in terms of the um, I mean obviously um, Lamert has given information about the initiative paper that they've put together. If you're looking for the 
uh, core text and the commentary on the definition itself. Right, you can right. find it on uh, our website, which is stopecoside.earth, um, and uh, you'll see there's a section in the drop-down menu on legal definition. You can also find it on our legal and academic website, which is ecocidelaw.com. Um, so you can find the English there. On the Stop Ecoside site, we already have an official Spanish translation. There's a French one coming soon, and we have unofficial translations so far in uh, German and Finnish, but there, were, there are others on the way, including Dutch and Swedish. Wow, thank you, that's great. The, another person on YouTube asked, if there is any time left. And um, this person's writing, we have only nine or 10 years to change into an ethical vegan plant-based food system. So how and what to do now? <laughs> well, yeah, of course, the, urgent, the, the urgency is, is, is very clear. And uh, again, the, what we see and what we do, and I think the Jojo, I like to hear your perspective on it as well, but it's a, it, 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 it really goes very rapidly now. The, the, uh, the uh, awareness of uh, of the problem, and that there really something should be should be done. Um, so yeah. yeah, and this conference also helps. So really, uh, it really changing the ball is really rolling a bit quicker and quicker, accelerating. I think that's absolutely true, and I think uh, there's a couple of things worth saying around the sort of time scale issue. Um, one is that um, the actual concept of ecocide, the word itself really helps in gathering the momentum because you know there's such a wide awareness that there's serious damage happening to nature in many different areas and having a word that brings that all together as you know this is all serious damage and destruction of nature um, is very helpful and of course as soon as people understand that word and that that's what it means there's an there's almost an intuitive moral response well that's wrong that should be stopped how is that even being allowed you know and that in itself really helps to gather the momentum on this uh, around this concept and it's very empowering and encouraging um, to know that where we have campaigns on the ground and associate groups on the ground in different countries, which we now have in 17 or 18 countries, um, we're also those are also often the places where in the political discourse, you know, the ecocide is becoming more of a live conversation. So that's very encouraging because it shows that everybody who's having those conversations in their own country, in their own language, in their own sector, is actively influencing this conversation at the political level, because we can see that by which politicians and diplomats are then coming to us saying, what's this thing about ecocide? So that's very encouraging. The other thing I think it's worth mentioning about timings is that as we're hearing from the UN, we're hearing from the scientists, you know, this is kind of the decisive decade for us to do something about the situation with ecocide. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, also, it's also important. Sorry, I'm, there's a slight sort of sound issue going on. I'm not I'm quite sorry. sure. I don't know if it's us. Yeah, I think it is. I can hear you. I don't sorry. know if I should be able to be hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the other issue with timing is this, that with ecocide law, it's actually quite important that we are not trying to put this in place tomorrow. And the reason that that's the case is that for countries to legislate for this by themselves is a little bit scary. There are, you know, obviously economic relationships already in place. Um, the implication of changing a ground rule that is so fundamental, you know, it, and, and it's been beautifully defined by the lawyers to actually enable it to intermesh with existing law. So that's, that's really amazing. But it does require a transition period. Now, it can't be a long one. We know we don't have a lot of time. But we also know that some time is required for politicians to actually put in place transition policies for the corporate world to look at compliance pathways. How do we approach, you know, infrastructure projects? Um, you know, how do we approach, you know, the food production? How do we approach all of these things in the knowledge that within a few years, this rule is going to change. And, and therefore, we need to be able to address that. And so all of this conversation that's happening, you know, in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of these other, other 10 countries where, where this is, is, is coming up and on, in the global media is really important because what it does is it says to those policymakers, those investors, those insurers in particular, um, this is a rule that is coming. You know, it may not be here yet, but it's coming. And that means that it, you, we have to all 
already be looking at shifting our focus and what is insurable and what is not. And interestingly, Polly Higgins had a conversation with uh, one of the big reinsurance companies, the ones who insure the insurers. And this was a few years ago. Obviously, she's not around now. But, um, but effectively, what they said to her is, we know a law like this is coming. We just don't know when. And so effectively, this movement is attempting to accelerate a moment of inevitability because we all know that we cannot continue ad infinitum to destroy ecosystems as we're doing. But what we want to do is bring this rule in place while we still have a chance of actually protecting them. <laughs> Rather than it being, you know, the, the last minute thing when, you know, all the trees are cut down and we're there with our last tree going, oh, we should have brought that rule in earlier. All right. Exactly. And if I may, just, just one, uh, one addition. That's, in fact, the re when we first drew it, and, and uh, let me take this opportunity to also mention uh, Sepida Orava as a co-author, Stella Peterson, who is at the conference right now, who is a co-author, many people contributed to it. But our first, uh, our first uh, draft was very, I would say, aggressive, uh, aggressive towards, uh, uh, but we changed the tune because indeed the awareness and we have to start a discussion and, and the, with, with the politicians so that they are aware that it is, uh, that it is coming. And in fact, I really see it um, this year as the tipping point of, uh, of Ecocide. There's many tipping points in the environment, but this is one tipping point we are making together. Wow, that's a very passionate and engaging uh, response. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Chil, and I think they were um, piqued interest by your avocado, Paul uh, Lammert, because they're asking, can you tell us more about the avocados and why they're related to ecocide? Is that because of export and import, because of transport, or are there other reasons? Because for Chil, it's a very well, traditional yeah. fruit, of course. No, of course, and uh, it has to do, uh, the, the, the real answer, it has to do with the invi invisible uh, invisibility of avocado uh, trade and production. Uh, when I, uh, I must admit, when I bought an avocado five years ago, you, you buy an avocado, you think, okay, I'm, I'm doing the right thing because I'm plant-based, it's healthy, uh, etc. cetera, uh, until you discover there's a whole network, the whole global network of an avocado production and what it takes uh, to get an avocado on my on my on my table, uh, there's there's a whole uh, system uh, in place, which is very destructive. So in our uh, initiative paper, we have the case of avocado production as a sign case. How how much water is involved? What is involved in uh, um, uh, the the production? But also uh, how to get it in the Netherlands. So transport, packaging, uh, selling, reselling. There's, an, there's, an, uh, there's a, also a social justice a component in it. There's land grabbing involved. Um, so uh, again, uh, and this is, this is of course also very in line with, with, uh, with our own uh, policy of the, of the party, food should be produced as close to, the, to, to where it's consumed as possible. So for chill, it's fine probably to have avocados, but we can't question, we can really question if it's uh, such a good idea to eat avocados in the Netherlands. Thank you. If we not grow, if we not grow them here. So I have a follow up question from Greece and they're asking if we put meat On and olives. avocado <laughs> together and, th and, and state this, them as, as reasons for ecocide, how can we use it as an argument that we have to move to a plant based food system? Well, <laughs> do you want to comment Jojo or? I mean I, I mean, I would comment in, in, the, in the most general terms, um, and I expect Lambert might be able to come back on more specifics. Um, but in general terms, the you know agribusiness generally, or it, it, it's um, the, ma the mass production and industrial farming of um, it, of meat, particularly, but but also, of course, of of, of um, plant aspects of our diet that are that that is the 
key problem with regard to ecocide. So in terms of seeing a, a law of ecocide approaching, what we would be wanting policymakers and producers and so on to do is to be looking at two things. You know, what are our methods and what scale are we operating on? And that, you know, and, and that comes back um, again to, to that recommendation from the UN now several years old, you know, that effectively local farming and local uh, uh, approaches that are compatible with local landscapes are actually the healthiest and the most likely to actually uh, succeed in feeding in feeding our communities in the best way. Um, and one, one of the aspects of, of, of ecocide law that is, is really interesting actually is that um, it goes for, the, it criminalizes those who are the key decision makers. So as with genocide, you're not approaching the foot soldiers um, with that law, you're approaching the controlling minds or the generals. And the same would be true of ecocide. So what you're looking at is being able to go as high up the chain in a given situation as possible to find where those, uh, those key decisions are being made. And there's a nice aspect to that, which is a, almost a sort of a rebalancing factor because you know, I mean, currently, for example, the International Criminal Court is kind of known for having made relatively few prosecutions and mostly of African warlords. Um, and, you know, there's this sort of imbalance between, with ecocide between, you know, where it's financed and where it, the, those decisions are made and where the ecocides actually happen, which is often in the global south. Um, so if you're aiming your law at the, at the top decision makers, there is the potential for actually bringing that home to the global north, if you like, in terms of creating that responsibility. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave Lamont to go into perhaps more specifics if he'd like to do that. Well, uh, no, I think you were quite specific, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> what, I, what, what, I can, what I can add is, is the following. It, it, it's the realization that the whole that the system, the, the, the intense um, uh, factory farming, etc., but also this production of uh, avocados, as we just uh, were discussing, they came from uh, the, the roots of that system. Uh, was 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 a was a in fact was a um, how shall I say it was a proper one. So the whole uh, uh, agricultural revolution in the 50s was brought forward to never have hunger again. So it started out as a good idea, to be honest. Not on animals, of course, because eating animals is never a good idea. But the, also on the on, uh, on, uh, on farming, on agriculture, it started out as we should not have hung, ever ha have hunger again. So it started out as a, as a good, really a good idea. But 50, 60, 70, 80 years down the line, uh, with the freedom of money, of capital, uh, that has become um, uh, perverse. So it, and, and I think I want to add the realization that's, that it intends to start out as a good idea is no longer a good idea. And politicians, once they're aware of it, they are more likely to shift um, if they see it's okay. We're not. We were. We were not wrong in the 50s, but what was right in the 50s is not proper for the for the 20s. Uh, in fact, I have an example. Uh, I think it was could. Uh, I think it was a, a, a particular kind of beans which are grown in South. Uh, America were flown to China to be packaged, to be uh, sold in Europe, um, and and that is a result of uh, of the system we uh, we live in, which optimizes uh, for costs and not for preserving of nature. But that started out as a good idea, believe it or not. Yeah. And and that realization is really uh, uh, crucial. Yeah, I think I think it's also um, worth thinking about the fact that. Um, it, this also goes even further back towards, um, you know, our relationship with nature and how we treat nature in regard to our finances. Definitely. Because, of course, you know, if, if you actually, in reality, I mean, obviously, I could go to the supermarket and I could buy an, a piece of organic produce and it will be more expensive, but it will be more reflective of the actual cost of producing the food. Whereas if I'm buying the mass produced item, it may be cheaper, but in reality, it's not cheaper because the impacts on the environment are not being costed in to True. that production um so you know there's there's there's, there's a whole kind of a, a imbalance there in, in in terms of that and i think the other thing that we also need to bear in mind as eaters of plant-based foods is that that we also have to take into consideration things like you know the use of pesticides and the mass growing of of plant food substances as well and not least because the insect ecosystems globally um, are absolutely crucial 
to the survival of you know pretty much every every other level of of, of our flora and fauna um and you know al although the vast majority of the damage is caused by the the meat industry we also need to take into account the fact that you know that mass production of plant-based food is also highly problematic with regards to the, the influence on ecosystems. So it, that we need this combination of what Lamert was talking about before, which is the localization, the increasing localization of food production, as well as, and, and, and um, sort of scaling, I mean, you know, more farmers rather than fewer farmers and larger farms, you know, is, is exactly. also going to make a huge difference. Exactly. Thank you. So we're, we are almost out of time. Um, I want to ask you one final question. I uh, hope you can answer it within the time we still have left. <laughs> it's a question from you two. This, is, this was a hint, I this guess. This is a challenge. <laughs> go, go on, go on. <laughs> so um, the last question is, what is the best way to take ecocide law forward with our regional and national legislators? Okay, shall I answer? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, take take our initiative uh, paper, take the information that is uh, stacked on uh, on uh, what what Jojo said, and 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 start start the discussion and and start using the language of of ecocide and 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 start uh, uh, start with a re I would say a reasonable conversation, divided in extremes, but also uh, with with your politician and to activate uh, to to really make it sharp, but also let people. Uh, come to their own realization, as Jojo said. Once you see the definition, once you have a discussion uh, on ecocide, uh, people will be amazed that it was not prohibited and banned a hundred years ago. Uh, <laughs> and and that would be my uh, my shortest advice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd second that. I'd also advise, of course, anyone to go to our website, stopecoside.earth, where we have a huge menu of different actions that you can take. Um, and we're also rolling out a kind of a, a across our different campaigns, a kind of manifesto where organizations can also get, get behind this. But as, as Lamar says, you know, there's something about this campaign that on one level is the easiest campaign in the world. Because, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have yet to encounter anybody on a one-to-one -one basis that thinks this is a bad idea. I don't think anyone, you know, it, it, regardless of whether they're working for Shell or whether they're, you know, an organic farmer, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's ultimately, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, people it's a, it's an understand. idea whose time who come. Exactly, it's, an idea, it's exactly. really an idea whose time has come and nothing is as powerful as that. Yeah. So, uh, it, no, sorry. No, no, I mean, I think, and again, just coming back to the fact that the word itself and the concept, just talk about it, talk about it in your networks, talk about it in your family, talk about it in your, your social circles. Um, it's, it's very, very powerful. Right. Thank you. We're out of time. Um, mm. Please join me in thanking Lamert and Jojo. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.